You're listening to The Practical Wealth Show with Curtis May, putting you in the driver's seat to control your finances. Let's start the Practical Wealth Talk about alternatives to Wall Street. Hello, everybody. All right. So Curtis May here. Welcome to another episode of The Practical Wealth Show. And so today, what I want to talk about is a concept called opportunity cost. And so in the seven principles of prosperity, the third step is measure, right? Measure, always measure your opportunity costs. What is opportunity cost? Is what your dollars earn, could earn if you did not commit to spend them elsewhere. And so awareness of opportunity costs enables you to recover them and ignore this as your peril. One of the things I find is that, you know, I always say there's there's two schools of thought in personal finance just taught out there. So there's the Susie Roman, Dave Ramsey, David Bach, you know, the primary, the, the you know, buy, you know, buy and hold, dollar cost average, get out of debt, uh, buy term investor difference, you know, accumulation, magical compound interest model. But if you took a corporate finance course, they don't really teach that. So velocity of money, see, money's got to move. So that you know, you've got to move money through assets. That's that's actually uh, principle number six. We'll go into that another day. But you know, look at leverage. So if you have a hundred thousand dollars of cash, a hundred thousand dollars of debt, that is a balance sheet neutral decision. I would argue if you took your cash and paid off the debt, you've actually made yourself poorer. All right. And, uh, and then they use permanent insurance strategy. So, you know, we're going to do a big workshop this weekend. And one of the biggest proponents of what we're teaching, what we call prosperity economics and using, you know, permanent insurance as a place to store cash. I'll, I'll tell people, all I'm teaching you is to do what the banks are doing with your money. So when we say, look, you want to run your personal economy, you know, people say, well, Curtis, what do you do? I help people set up families and businesses, set up their own privatized banking systems. But what you've got to understand is how money works. So there's two things we're going to cover today. And the first one is the concept that you finance everything you buy. All right. And it's amazing how much pushback I get with this, you know, so, you know, we use insurance, we teach people to collateralize their insurance, you know, to uh, make loans against your cash value. So you're borrowing the insurance company's money. So people say, well, uh, you know, why would I pay to borrow my own money? Good point. You're not borrowing your own money, but let's, let's look at it this way. So I asked the person this, so I I don't want to, you know, they're fighting me on, you know, paying the loans back. We call it being an honest banker. I say, well, let me ask you this. So if you had $5,000 saved, right? Cause you finance everything you buy. So that means you either, if you don't have any money, you pay interest to use other people's money. So, and so when you take a loan out and you don't have collateral, then you're using future earnings as collateral. So if you go buy a car and you don't have any money, you're and, and they give you a $300 a month car payment. Well, you've just collateralized your earnings. That means they're borrowing against your ability to have a job, have good credit, earn money. And you have now uh, lowered, you, you've committed yourself to a 60 month payment where you're giving up future earnings for 60 months and transferring. So you buy a $30,000 car, that's like a $560 payment. So you're going to pay 30000 uh, what is it like thirty thousand three hundred and almost four thousand dollars? You know, on the car, right? So think about that. So you bought a car, so that's three hundred grand, not counting the interest <laughs> that you pay on it, and not counting the opportunity cost of what the three hundred thousand dollars would have been worth had you been able to keep it. Okay, and so now that's add that up. Uh, I might do a little video on this so I can show you the numbers because there's everything I talk about is backed up with math. This is not Curtis's opinion. This is numbers. Okay. And what do they say? Liars figure, but figures don't lie. <laughs> and uh, so saying that most people don't have a hundred grand in a 401k, but it's not that you're not making money. You give your money away to people that create the situations, control the outcomes and profit off of you not understanding the game. All right. So I'm trying to teach you the game. And so you finance everything you buy. So if you don't have money, you use other people's money and interest is what you pay to use other people's money. But see, here's the other part. And people have such a hard time with this. If you have savings, so let's say you have $10,000, you like to keep your savings at five grand. 
All right. And you withdrew four grand, you need to, you know, fix a roof or do something around the house or tuition, whatever. So now your savings is at a thousand. So you're not feeling pretty good because your threshold is low and that increases your anxiety. Now, so how would you get that money back up to $5,000? What do you have to do? You've got to make deposits. So you, if you want to do it in a year, you got to save, uh, what, for, uh, um, $400 a month deposits into the account, right? Well, guess what? That's a payment, a deposit payment, same difference, tomato, tomato. And so you financed it. So when you pay cash, you finance it. And then you cheat yourself because you don't get opportunity costs. You don't treat your money as if there's a cost to capital. That's what we're going to do another talk on economic value added, but you know, which is just, you got to treat your money like there's a cost to it, see, because you cheat yourself. So if you were to, um, let's say money costs you, let's say you can make 10%. I just, I don't feel like calculating, so I'm going to use a round number. So that means in a year, your 5,000 would make 500, right? So if you only put back 5,000, you cheat yourself because you didn't cover the cost of money or or, or let's say 5% or $250. So you would need to put in $5,250 back into the account to make up for the opportunity cost. But who does that? Nobody, right? Most people don't. I won't say nobody. And uh, so that is being an honest banker. So one of the things that we kind of force people to do, forces using the word loosely, quotation marks, is to be an honest banker, treat their money as if it has capital because either way you finance it. So you either you either pay somebody to use their money or you're giving up interest you could be earning. So you finance everything you buy. Make no mistake about it. And see, what happens is when you use your money, your money is gone. So it's even if you're an investor, because, oh, I'm going to pay cash for the house. Well, you put cash in the house. Equity has no, I don't care if you're going to flip it, whatever. You're going to make money off the investment, but equity in and of itself has a zero rate of return. So what if you could have your cake and eat it too, where you could have it in another entity while it's still making money and you could now access your capital, leave the money where it is, but use other people's money to do other things. We call that creating collateral capacity and to um, uh, make your dollars do more than one thing. So if you're, let's say we teach a system where is if uh, using the permanent insurance, if your money is earning 4% and uh, you've got 10 grand, so that means in a year you've, you've earned $400, right? Um, and now let's say you put it in it. So let's say you, you borrow it from the insurance company, they charge you five, right? But you could put it in an entity that paid you eight or 10, or you used it for yourself to finance a used car or a vacation. And you become an honest banker and you, you and this is what we help people do. You create a payment plan back to yourself at eight or 10. Well, now you're earning, uh, you know, the spread which is you pay yourself back at the cost over the cost of money. So now you're beginning to capture the profits you would have given to the bank. Your money's still making money, earning dividends, protection, and you still did the thing you want to do, but you don't have the opportunity cost. So you still get to maintain uninterrupted compounding. All right. So I hope that makes sense. You know, that is you. Fi- so the first concept is you finance everything you buy. So you got to get your money. So when you pay cash, that is no bargain. You're giving up interest you could be earned. That is, you know, you got it's a little counterintuitive. So you got to get your mind around that. And then you've got to understand opportunity costs. He's for every dollar you acquire, you've got a choice. You can spend that money or you can invest it. So invested dollars grow over time, but spent dollars are gone forever down the drain. And see the potential future value of those spent dollars is called opportunity costs. Right? So ask yourself this: what is opportunity cost? See, do you earn an interest? On an expense. No. Is the expense money spent accessible? See, once you spend it, it's gone. You've just transferred it to somebody else's economy, right? So if you send an extra mortgage payment or double up on a on a on a car payment, you are you think you're paying interest. What you're doing is you're giving up your ability to make that money make money for you. Because I don't like like doubling up on car payments because the payment doesn't change. So I'll do it with a credit card or a, line, a credit, you know, like an interest only credit line, because if you pay more, you can improve your cash flow. 
But if you pay extra on the mortgage, guess what? The payment is still due the next month. And you could, I could argue you could pay extra money for a year, but you lose your job. You can't say, well, hey, you know, I've been paying you extra money. Can you give me a break and, you know, let me not make payments for a while? No. So that means you should have been saving that money where it was making money for you. And if you want to pay it off, pay it all off at once. <laughs> okay. And um, let compound interest, uninterrupted compounding work for you. OK, or put that money somewhere else where it could make you money. So that is a key. And see, so what the money would have been worth at some future date is called opportunity costs. OK, and so that is major. And that is something they don't teach in personal finance. OK, and that is a real. And so you, you've you got to incorporate that uh, because everybody that's teaching you to um, handle money, they know opportunity costs. They understand you finance everything you buy. They don't try to pay off their mortgage. They don't let money accumulate. So you got to do what they do. All right. So if you let's think about this, if you had a ten thousand dollar one time expense. Right. And let's say you were getting six percent on that money. That one decision over 30 years. That ten thousand dollars would have grown to fifty thousand dollars to the original purchase. And that's just one purchase. That's opportunity. So if you look at the big ticket items or the daily decisions that you make. You're, you know, if, if you got to kind of rethink how you manage your cash flow. OK. And so one of the things that uh, and I challenge you, listen, if you'd like to see how to do this, go to my website, practicalwealthadvisor.com or look in the show notes and just schedule a, a 15 minute meeting with me and I'll, I'll show you this. But the um, you've got to one of the things that we talk about in the money for life system is you've got to deconstruct your personal economy. Because right now your personal economy is set up to make everybody else rich, but you, right? Because of the, most of the traditional, uh, if you boil down all of, of, of typical financial advice boils down to give your money to us okay? <laughs> and uh, let us manage it for 30 years. Let us let you put up hundred percent of money, take a hundred percent of the risk to maybe make 15 or 20% of the profits. If there's profits at all. I hope I didn't butcher it, but I'm kind of paraphrasing Jack Bogle, the founder of Vanguard. All right. And, um, you know, or you diversify by diversified assets. You know, and Buffett says diversification is for people that don't know what they're doing. So if you know what you're doing, you don't need to diversify. And then when you're, when you're talking about diversify, diversification is not having, uh, you know, a bunch of different stocks or a few different mutual funds. People say, well, if you're in a mutual fund, you get professional management, diversification and liquidity. Right. And you're in a hundred. I said when I used to do mutual funds, I would say, listen, think of this. If you got a penny in a hundred different stocks, what's the chances of all of the companies that you own stock in going out of business at the same time? Right. Which is pretty low, but that's not quite how it works. You know, so you are diversified, but you're all in one asset class called paper. So think what happened in 2006. Everything went down because there are systemic risk. And so you're just in one asset class. So when you think about, you need to broaden your 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 vision, uh, and and look at uh, the whole playing field. And you want to see four asset classes, right? Business, real estate, paper, and commodities, right? And so now, if you're diversified, you understand what's going on, going on from a macro standpoint, and then you are. Diversifying, you have some money in businesses. You, you know, let's say you like business, vending machines, you have retail, you do online, you do Amazon drop shipping, you know, you've got a, a store. And so you want to invest in your marketing. You know, you want to invest in personal development. You want to invest in systems so you can grow your revenue. That's your best investment. Then maybe you want to take some of that earned income and you buy other passive businesses or you buy real estate. That's diversification number two. And what you're doing is converting earned income to passive income, right? You could do paper, paper could be, you know, a bridge loan environment or things that generate cash flow. See, the name of the game, folks, you want to become financially independent is to generate cash flow. It's not hoping things go up. You're investing for capital gains. But remember Benjamin Graham's definition of an investment, is something you put your money into where your principal is safe and you have a reasonable opportunity to make a profit. Anything other than that is speculating. So I'm not saying you shouldn't do whatever you're doing. I'm not giving any investment advice, but I'm going to ask yourself, are you investing based upon that definition or are you speculating? And that's the question. And you need to answer that question. You want to kind of look at, all right, how can I get dollars to do multiple things? 
how can I reduce risk, reduce taxation, reduce volatility, and increase my liquidity use control and equity on my funds? See, if you don't know how to do that, uh, I would, I would, one of the things I would recommend is you go to uh, in the show notes, download the book, you know, financial planning has failed and read that and then give me a call and we'll show you how to, you know, we'll answer any questions you have about it and see if there's something that would work for you. So anyway, I want to have a short call today. And so remember you finance everything you buy and you've got to measure opportunity costs. What would your dollars earn if you did not spend or commit them elsewhere? Opportunity cost is major. So remember our overall philosophy is that there is more opportunity in actually helping our clients minimize the losses in their financial life then you'll ever make trying to pick winning investments. So if you've got a buck and it's got holes, in, you know, my suggestion is that you plug the holes first. OK, so become more efficient and then go about, you know, cutting volume because it's going to leak right through. And most people have major leaks in their personal economy. So, you know, I'm the leak clear guy. All right. So you guys have a great day and I hope you enjoy the little short lesson and uh, we will see you when we see you. Have a good day. Bye. Thanks for listening to Practical Wealth. To access the show notes and resources, go to practicalwealthshow.com. To get your questions on the show, go to practicalwealthshow.com. This show is for entertainment purposes only. Before you make any investment decisions, consult a professional. This show is copyrighted by Practical Wealth. Written permission must be granted before syndication or rebroadcasting.